Well, um, today we're going to talk about a difficult topic. I just want to let you know I love you, okay? I care about you. And uh, I would rather skip a topic like this because I don't want to deal with it. We're going to deal with church discipline and how to remove someone from the church. Aren't you glad you came to church? <laughs> yeah. We're going to be talking about that today. Why? The Bible talks about it. And so we're, we're going to do that today. And I heard people say many times, oh, pastor, why can't we get back like the early church? They had her act together. You look at the book of Acts. Often the book of Acts is the highlight reel of the first 35, 40 years or 50 years of the church. But do you realize your whole New Testament is written because there's problems in the church? So if you're looking for a perfect church, there's no such thing. But God, despite ourselves, still, the Bible says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So we try to build it, but Jesus builds it. And with all the destruction and all the difficulty, God still comes through. So I want to encourage you with that. Hey, listen, I just wanted to, how many remember the 1980s? How many like the 1980s? The greatest music in the world, right? Okay. I look at myself like Michael J. Fox in Back to the Future, okay? I had the mullet. I had the Reeboks high tops with the acid jeans, okay? Can I tell you a little secret before that, when I was a teenager? Before I became cool, when I was just developing, when I was like 12 or 13 years old, and what happened? My legs were like a man's legs, but my chest was like a little child. I looked like the Liberty Bell, <laughs> but there was no liberty. So I always used to wear a jacket to cover that. And then finally, I came into my own. And now, of course, I'm a perfect specimen of a man minus 30 pounds. <laughs> but the 1980s were, were a fun decade. But I remember 1986, uh, I, I was uh, taking an SAT. Oh, we love those. And in the middle of the test, they actually broke up our SAT and gave us an announcement about what took place in the nation. Let me just give you a little bit of background. You might have heard of this, this woman, Krista. She was a, a teacher. Ronald Reagan in 1984 said, hey, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to send a civilian into space. And there was a national search. And this woman, beat, she came from Concord, New Hampshire, 37 years old, like me. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Thou shalt not lie. Okay. 37 years old, she was a teacher, she was on the Today Show, she was on Nightline, she was on 2020, she was in all these programs, she was plastered all, all, all through everything, and they're going to take off and have a Challenger flight, first teacher in space, uh, 17 to 18% of the American public, eyes were glued on it, kids, they rolled in TV, they used to roll in TV sets into the kids' classrooms, eyes are glued on this thing, it's going to be a historic and a wonderful day, teachers in space. Be fantastic. But there was a little bit of a problem, and this is the crew she was with. On the morning of the launch, the engineers had some concerns. Kind of like accountants. How many people like accountants, right? You can't be spending that kind of money. I mean, all right, we don't like those people, but they're important. The detail people are important, right? But this is the 25th shuttle space mission. It's been without a hitch, it's been going great, it's exciting. Everyone loves a shuttle program. And they're going to look at Halley's Comet. They're going, to launch, they're going to launch a satellite. Teacher in space. Everyone's watching. This is fantastic. We're going to encourage our, our economy. or encourage our country. It was a moment of pride for our country. Ronald Reagan was all excited about it. Everyone was excited about it. And then in the morning of it, of, of January 28th in, in Cape Canaveral, there was a problem. There was a freeze. And so all, as you can see, that's actual picture. And there's the booster rocket there. It was all freezing, and, and the energy engineer said, hey, listen, guys, these O-rings that are on the bottom of the boosters, the O-rings keep the fuel in. Uh, I, I don't think we should launch because they might not function properly because they were frozen. So the DI said, it's going to be fine. Oh, you engineers, be quiet. We're going to have to do it. And so the engineers told the uppers, people above them, and they ignored the engineers. Are we good to go? Go for it. 25th launch. We got this down. We don't want to. We, we've been delaying like crazy. The camera crews are here. Now it's nice outside. Let's launch this thing. Let's have a historic, a beautiful day. You guys are too worried about everything. 99% of the things you worry about never happen anyhow. Just go on. It's okay. No big deal. Go ahead. And so what do they do? They launch uh, at 1139 in Cape Canaveral. They launched the shuttle. 
11.39, within 73 seconds, this happened. And they announced it to our class in the middle of the SAT. And the whole nation, it was like, it was like a JFK moment, if you guys remember that. I don't, because I wasn't born, because I'm 37 years old. <laughs> but it was a horrible set of circumstances, and it was because there was a problem, a small little problem, an O-ring. Eh, it's going to be okay. We'll let it go this time. The engineers, eh, it's no big deal. And as a result, there was untold tragedy as a result of that. You know, sometimes annoying small flaws of sin can lead to catastrophic consequences. I don't want to say anything about the company. I know the boss is doing this. I know we're, we're putting this product in the building that's not very good, but it could cause cancer, but we don't want to, we got a, a sense on the dollar that we can't really afford to do it. Or maybe you're working for a company and you've got this job you've been looking and, and the, the company goes, to, the boss goes to your church and whatever, and you're working for him, an accounting firm or something like that, and what they're doing is wrong, and, and you know it could cause problems. And so as a result of that, you kind of be quiet. You don't want to say anything. You don't want to rock the boat. Or maybe you, maybe you have somebody that uh, is in the church, and they're in leadership, and I, I know, I know they're kind of doing that and the other and embezzling funds, I'm not, but I'm not going to say anything about it because I don't want to cause any troubles. And this can begin to happen. We can, ignoring the small flaws can lead to all kinds of problems. Well, this happened in the Corinthian church. The Apostle Paul in chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians talked about, hey, I'm your spiritual father. I care about you. Then he actually lays down the law and says what's going on. He talks about the sin that shocks. He says the following. It's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you. Now, the word sexual immorality, sexual is the word we get pornea, where we get the word pornography, and in its context, it means all kinds of things outside the bounds of God's design and desire for humanity because it will hurt humanity. So he says there's all kinds of stuff going on. And by the way, they were sleeping with prostitutes in the church. They were doing all kinds of stuff. And he says, oh, by the way, here's the, here's the, the worst thing you guys are doing. He says, it's actually reported that there is sexual morality among you and the kind that is not even tolerated among pagans for a man has his father's wife. And the grammar there simply means that some guy is having a sexual ongoing relationship with his stepmother. That's sick. That's absolutely sick. He says, even the pagans don't, pronounce, don't do that. Cicero described such behavior who was not a Christian and a Roman contemporary. That kind of sin was considered horrible. And, and this is a society that a lot of prostitution legally, a lot, a lot of things. But they, the, even the Greeks and the Romans like, this is bad. And the church was tolerating something the world did not even do. And they were proud about it. Ah, yeah, we have grace. God forgives. You know, I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. We're not quite sure what happened, but it was pretty bad. And so... In Leviticus, it says sexual relations with someone like that, with your father's wife, is, is a death penalty. It was bad, bad meals. And so the church became, par became proud and like, oh, we're, we're, we're evolved as a culture. See, when the church tolerates sin, it loses its, its moral authority and witness. The world looks at us and says, well, why would I want to do what they're doing? They're worse than I am. And let's be honest, a lot of stuff has been worse than we've seen in the past. You see, we've gone from being extremely legalistic to so permissive. We don't even talk about sin anymore. I'm going to share some examples this today. I didn't want to share, but as I began to pray about it, I really think I'm supposed to share it because the Apostle Paul talked about Peter getting it wrong and called out people in the Scriptures. The church today, we want to talk about this person. Because there's two opposites I see going on in the church today. There are people that are so legalistic, it's ridiculous. Some of you grew up in those old-fashioned churches where they measure your skirt length when you come in. You come in, okay, no, no, no. And then you, you can't wear makeup. Hey, if the barn needs painting, paint the barn, right? Amen. So, <laughs> just saying. I'm talking about barns. And <laughs> 
Anyhow, the women would grow their hair. Not allowed to grow their hair. They, not allowed to cut their hair. They grew their hair. No makeup, nothing. Dresses down the here. And then what they do is they tie their hair into a bun. Like a big, big beehive. We call it bondage. So, and, and then, right, some of you grew that way. And they're judging you. How dare you? In fact, I had a, I had a pastor, I'm sorry, a, a Sunday school teacher when I was growing up who went to a Bible college in the Midwest, uh, CBC, and he got thrown out of the school for watching the movie called The Robe, which was like about the Romans and during Christ's time. It was nothing bad. He got thrown out. You went to the devil's house. And so we've gone to this extreme. And now it's like, ah, we don't want that. We live in grace. Now it's like this. The pastor sleeps with the secretary, marries her. Two weeks later, they start a church down the street. You think I'm making this stuff up? There are churches across the country right now that stuff happens. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. And this is what happens. So we go into the other extreme. Well, oh, grace, grace, grace. And I even pastors say, hey, we don't want to talk about these things. And I've been told, can I be frank with you, even though my name's Eric? I've been told at pastors' growth conferences, hey, guys, don't talk about the sin in the church. Just talk about what's going on good. And I, I disagree. We, we need to deal with stuff. And, and, and there's no fear for sin. And we've lost our witness, not ours, the other churches, of course. We've lost our witness because of it. And so let's go ahead and read the context of this passage. Then we're going to go back and discuss it some more. You guys ready? So if you want to open your Bibles, you can. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 5. We're going to read all 13 verses. Uh, it's actually reported that there is that there is sexual morality among you and the kind that's not even tolerated even among pagans for a man has his father's wife and, and you are arrogant. In other words, you guys think you're better than anyone else. You can make up the rules. I don't like the game. I'm going to change it. I don't like Monopoly. I'm going to change it. Ought you, neither, ought you not rather mourn? In other words, you should be sad about the sin and deal with it. Let him who's done this be removed from among you. Kick him out of the church. What, are you kidding me? He's a tithing guy. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit as if I was present. The Apostle Paul is not astral projecting. He's not, as some people teach, he shapeshift through the air. No. What he's basically saying is, I have given authority to you. For example, if I'm on, away on a trip, and Sandra's got to deal with our children when they were small and they're misbehaving. We usually come together on this. Your dad and I, I said, honey, you're in charge. And you, you, whatever you say, I'll, I'll, by the way, husbands, that's a really good. Just tell you what, honey, you're in charge. Whatever you say goes. Can I hear an oh, no? Yeah, okay. All kidding aside. So Sandra has the authority when I'm gone, take care of the kids, whatever she says. And I'll stand by her because I trust her and because we work as one unit. So whenever she says when I'm gone, hey, that's, it's our word, not just hers. And that's the same thing the Apostle Paul said. So anyone that teaches you can ask your project, please. That's nonsense. So there's a lot of nonsense going on in the church today. Can I just say it? I'm, I'm just, I'm, I, are you being judgmental? No. I, okay, let's move on. For though absent in the body, I'm present in the spirit as at present. I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus. In other words, I've given you authority. I've delegated this to you. In the military, they'll delegate to the soldiers. The soldiers and the platoon leaders have power, right? You delegate authority. And so as long as you stay within that authority structure. So I pronounce judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, now listen to this one. You guys ready for this one? You're to deliver this man to Satan. What? We'll get into it. Hang on. For the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Let me just stop to this for a quick second. We'll get into more detail. He's basically saying it's better to let him go, face the consequences, and come to his right mind than to protect where he loses his way. What does that mean? We're not going to get into it today. Let's just say if you lose your way with God, not a good thing. Verse 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? A little leaven makes the dough rise, and all you need is a tiny bit. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really 
are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, but not with old leaven. During the Passover meal, what they would do is go through the house and get rid of all the leaven and only make unleavened bread. So they would cleanse themselves. He's saying Christ is that sacrifice for us. Don't allow sin in the camp. All right? So, um, the leaven of malice and evil, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Sincerity and what? Truth. Jesus is the way. He's the what? Truth. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexual immoral people, not all meaning that sexual immoral of the world, or the greedy, or the swindlers, or idolaters, or the greeters. Oh, the greedy. <laughs> I'm going to go on Facebook and Instagram. Ah, they're greedy. Look at the car they're driving. They're bad. No, we're not talking about being a judge like that. Verse 11, but now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. In other words, they're a believer in Jesus Christ. They say they're of Christ. You have a relationship with them. Who bears the name of brother, he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, or drunkler and swindler. So everyone needs to leave the church right now because we're all in big trouble. Is that what he's talking about? Hang on. Not even eat with such a person. And when you have a meal with someone, you would have fellowship they would consider part of your family. For what have I do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church who are to judge? Well, I thought the Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. Right? And so we should not be involved in judging the world. We should stay in our church. Don't get involved with politics. Don't get involved with anything with the school board. It's only in the church. That's not what the Apostle Paul is saying. The Apostle Paul, first of all, the Apostle Paul is writing to a culture that was under Roman domination and they were under subjection to the Roman. They had no rights at all. The Apostle Paul, incidentally, uses Roman citizenship to protect his rights to worship. So he's not saying that, as some would say. He's basically saying, I don't have the moral authority to go to my neighbor. Hey, you're living in sin. No, I could tell them what you're doing is wrong, and God will give you an account one day. But I don't have the same authority because we're not in the same family. For example, you don't spank your neighbor's kids. Of course, when I grew up, the neighbors did spank me. I'm, I'm, I kid you not. I was playing with fire, and the neighbor, neighbors, uh, my, my friend's neighbors, uh, I can't remember her name, Mrs. Blaine. What a name, Mrs. Blaine. Yeah. She spanked me and then told my mother. My mother thanked her. And then I got a whipping. Don't call DCF, it's too late. But we worked as a community to look out for each other, right? I'm, I'm not saying it's bad or good. Come next week and I'll have Pastor Randy talk about that. But, you know, John, I'm not going to judge the outsiders. I, I'm not going to spank someone else's kid. Hey, you're in my house. You have a responsibility for who's in my house. So God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Well, why on earth would you purge? Do you not know a little leaven spoils a loaf? I heard of a woman that her children were watching these movies and they were dropping, you know, the F-bomb and sex and all that. But have you ever noticed that when I used to grow up, I used to watch a movie, it was fine. As soon as my mother entered the room, they'd swear. <laughs> right? Well, anyhow, the mother came into the room and she saw what was going on. She didn't like, oh, mom, it's only a little swearing, only a little violence, only a little killing. It's no big deal. So she was making brownies. Going to make them for them to watch TV. And they had a family dog, Fido, whatever his name was. And Fido went outside to relieve himself. So she decided to go outside and just take a little bit of Fido, his little gift behind. She put it into the batter, mixed it, and baked brownies for her family. And brought them to her children and said, well, oh, mom, wait, 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 before I give it to you. just want to let you know what I did. I went outside. Here's a little bit of the part I took off. I put it in a brownie mix. You want to have it? No, that's disgusting. Then why are you allowing this a little sin in your life? DCF uh, arrested her. She's in prison. No, I'm just kidding. That's not what happened. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's sin is like a, a blow pop. Remember the blow pops? I, used to, I still like them today. Um, and so you blow a cherry blow pop, inside is the gum. So, oh, this is fantastic, you love it, you enjoy the lollipop, and then you get to the middle where the Tootsie Roll or the gum is, 
Well, what really it's like, it's like having arsenic in the middle of the, of the blow pop and you're enjoying the candy. You're just salivating over it. Finally, after a ser- a sin is fun for a season and then it will kill you. Sin is a serious thing. Jesus died on the cross because of sin. It's that toxic. Well, you're not being tolerant. I, tolerant to eat brownies? I don't think so. So what are we to do? Well, the Apostle Paul talks about this and what we're supposed to do. He actually goes on to speak about this even more. He says in Thet Corinthians, he talks about the we think It could very well be he's talking about the same God. He says this. Most of you opposed him, and that was punishment enough. Now, however, it is the time to forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overcome by discouragement. So I urge you now to reaffirm your love for him. So he's talking about, you guys, how to deal with the situation? Now handle it correctly. Uh, let me show you something else. The Bible says this. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, which means sin, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Spirit of gentleness. Why? Keep watch on yourself lest you be tempted. Now, we're going to get into judging and how we're supposed to do it in a few moments. Okay? The danger of sin is pretty bad. And so we're dealing with clear sin here. How are we supposed to handle clear sin? Well, here are some steps to deal with sin. Jesus talks about in Matthew 18. I'm not going to go through a long explanation because most of you might be familiar with it. If you're not, here it is. The first thing you do, someone offends you, someone's involved with something, maybe someone, is, uh, someone on the staff is doing something that's wrong, or, or your friend is doing something wrong, maybe they're, um, well, maybe they're living in a relationship where they're compromising their, their sexual purity, and they're kind of having a little fling going on, but they serve in the church, and you know it. So you go to them, you go to them privately, hey, bro, I don't know what's going on here, listen, I understand, but I've noticed how you and, you and her are talking a little bit. I don't know what's going on, but you're spending way too much time talking to her. And uh, can you show me a text message? No, that's none of your business. You're being judgmental. Go to the person privately. You're still not listening. You see something going on? Grab a couple other guys. Hey, guys, listen, we get to talk to John because this this is fictitious, okay? (laughs) We should make it clear. My middle name is John. We got to talk to Jacqueline or whatever, John. So you're going to talk to John now. Then we take two or three. Hey, what are you guys talking about? I'm doing fine. I'm doing nothing wrong. My wife doesn't really love me. I found my soulmate, and you know what? It's only a piece of paper anyhow. So I told him that. He refused. He's still in the church, still on the board of the church. So now what do you do? You take two or three with you. Then after that, hey, he's still not listening to you. Tell the church. Tell their leadership. Hey, guys, we got a situation where uh, John is doing this. We know what's wrong. We've told him. I went to him privately. Now he went, and then another church comes and talks to him. Hey, listen, what are you doing is wrong. We can't have you in leadership. In fact, you're not allowed to be in church and have this kind of situation going on because of what you've done. And if he still refuses the leadership, what do we do? Separate from him. The Bible says treat him like a tax collector. Now, whoa, what does that look like? How does that happen? Listen, everybody, we got to be very, very careful because we have to be careful because sin can really give a big problem. It can cause all kinds of sin in the church and cause destruction on other people's marriages. Sin is communicable. It really is. And so when you allow this, now, how do we handle it correctly? Well, I'm so glad you asked because we are going to get into that in a few moments. But here's a situation of the danger of tolerating with sin. It's not something we should be doing. We have to do, we have to remove it. So delivering to Satan, removing the covering. For example, if you have someone living, you have a son or a daughter living with you and they're taking, they're onto drugs. They start taking crack cocaine, next thing you know, on heroin. And they go out and they get in trouble for stealing. They get incarcerated. They put it into prison. And you bail them out and bring them back home. You hire them the best lawyer you can. And they sit there and get their act together. And they go out and do it again. They're doing it. And they go out. And then sure enough, they get arrested. You bail them out again. You bring them back home again. And they end up being a functioning drug addict for 10 years. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do is say, I love you but you need to get out of this house unless you do what I tell you to do. We're not, and oh, that's not love. Yeah, it's real love. I'm not saying the parents that allow the child to live there don't love them. So sometimes love has to be tough. To be a real woman or a real man, you need to stand up and have some grit in your love. 
not dealing with this is actually a form of hate. If you really think about it. So what do you got to do? Release the covering. So in a church, if someone did it a number of years ago, we had a situation here at Cornerstone. I'm very careful how I say it, but we had a situation a number of years ago, quite a long time ago, where we had a person that had influence in the church, pretty significant influence, and, 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 and the person showed some problem here, and we thought it was something small. Well, through investigation, God exposed it. First of all, he warned me through someone in our church that had a dream six months before. He said, Pastor, I had a dream. You were on the stage, and this person was pointing at you and laughing, and it was in this individual. I'm like, oh, whatever. I put it in the back of my mind, and then when I heard it, I'm like, uh-oh, the Lord's warning me. Sure enough, this guy was involved with severe sexual sin, breaking families apart, lying, horrific sin, horrific sin that could destroy a church. And so the leadership of Cornerstone got together. We sat him down. We did it in redemption. Listen, what you're doing is wrong. You're going to have to step out of everything. He was okay with that for initially. And you're going to have to leave the church. You're not allowed here anymore because of the ramifications you're doing. We want you to, if it, uh, we'll support you and help you. We'll fly you someplace. We'll give you counseling, stream counseling. We're going to, we'll take care of you. We even pay you money to get healed. But you got to do this, this. He wouldn't do it. Would not do it. And so he left. Then I got word on a Sunday morning saying he's on his way. I said, say what, Willis? No, he's not on his way. And I said this. Now, don't take me wrong. I said, heads are going to roll. And I called the police. I said, he's not allowed on this campus. I don't care if they have to arrest me. He is not allowed on this campus. And so what happened was he didn't come to the campus. And we had to deal with it. It wasn't easy, friends. And believe me, there was more we could say about it. It, it, it was going to be a bad scenario. We had to remove the sin from the camp. And I've seen people remove sin from the camp in a very judgmental way, then they fall in the same sin. Be very careful about this. It's like, it's like removing sin. If you go to a surgery, right? A surgeon, what a surgeon will do, you have an operation. You have a tumor that could kill you. And it's very, it spreads. And so what does the surgeon do? The surgeon washes himself, purifies himself with a team of people. They put on a special gown that's clean, surgical gloves, a mask, an eye guard. Then they go in, not with a butcher's knife, they go in with a scalpel. So what have they done? They purified themselves. They get rid of all the germs in their life. Jesus says, before you judge your brother, take the log out of your brother's eye, take, I'm sorry, before you take the speck out of your brother's eye, take the log out of yours first. God, is there any sin in my life? Lord, I know not by your grace I could fall. And the surgeon then, clean hands, cuts and surgically removes it. What happens if the patient says, I don't care what you say, I'm not going to go for surgery. The person could die and could spread a disease to somebody else. Imagine that. This is how we're supposed to handle it. He says, delivering to Satan is removing a covering. There comes a point where you are to deliver someone to Satan. Sometimes the devil will use his powers like the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son? Dad, I want all your money. Goes out and makes a mess of it. He comes to his senses. He would never come to his senses if his father kept bailing him out. Some of you need to stop bailing out your spouse, your children, or somebody else. Let them fail. One of the nicest things you can do is let them fail. It's going to hurt like Hades. It's going to hurt, I'm going to say, it's going to hurt like hell. When you're a parent and you have to give tough love to your kid, it does not feel good. But you're going to have to let them go. Why? Because let God work and say, I'm here. The moment you want, I'm back. And what did the prodigal son do? The father was looking in the distance. The moment the son showed, showed rest, restoration, he ran to him and enveloped him and brought him back. But he had to fall first. Sometimes we have to let that happen. You see? You see, you're to deliver this man. So tough love is not about destroying, but about restoring. Not about destroying, but about restoring. Bible says, godly sorrow leads to repentance. Worldly sorrow leads to destruction. Dealing with clear sin is what we have to do. Let me give you this story, what can happen to a society, what can happen to a church if you don't deal with sin. I was not going to tell the story, but I'm going to tell a story because it's a national news, even though I've been told not to talk about it from people. I'm sorry, I have to talk about it because it's in the national news, and we have to tell the story. 
There was a pastor back in 1982, a young guy, very uh, gifted communicator. He was on the circuit doing evangelistic meetings. He was married to his wife, had a child, stopped in Oklahoma and stayed at a person's house, uh, uh, one of the elders of the church. There was a young girl who was 12 years old, 1982, Christmas Eve. He goes into his room after grooming her and begins to do things to her, kind of, it's bad, sexual molestation. I'll just call it what it is. And this goes on, not for one time, twice. It went on for four and a half years until she was 16 and a half. Her father found out, told the elders of the church where the pastor came from. He's on staff. He was not the head pastor at that time. It was called, Sh I'll just say it. It's called Shady Grove, no longer in existence, in Texas, South Lake, Texas. And uh, in the, the church, uh, the guy would, God, I'll say his name. I'm going to do it. His name is Robert Morse, a pastor, gifted communicator, started an amazing church. And so let me tell you what happened. So the elders got together, Shady Grove, and said, hey, you know, we're going to have to deal with this situation. What you've done is wrong. They didn't call the police. They just kind of like go for restoration. And within two years, he's back preaching. Then they give the blessing for him to start a church called Gateway. I'm going to say it. Gateway blew up. He was a very gifted communicator, gave over $330 million to missions. The church was phenomenal worship. God still did amazing things through it. Why? Because the gospel does not return without void. This man grew in popularity. He claimed to have 100,000 people a week. It's all about the numbers, right? And all this money and this and the other. And, you know, we like, I like, the, I think this guy's a good preacher. Great worship, right? This woman named Cindy, who was molested as a 12-year-old, comes out later on. She's 55 years old. She tried to bring restitution to this, or tried to bring accountability. Finally, because of the culture we live in today, we've got to thank God for the culture of responsibility. It came out. They did an investigation. He denied it at first and tried to uh, gloss it. Well, I was a youthful indiscretion. I didn't know it was a young lady. No, it wasn't a young lady. It was a 12-year-old girl. And God help me. I'll say it. This is Eric speaking. God help me if someone messes with one of our children in our church. Amen. God help. You may have to bail me out. Don't tolerate this. So this is what happened to the woman, the little girl. So she came out. The church dealt with it. He left. He, he, he retired. I'm sorry. And then the church, national story. Now the, the world looks like the church. They don't even do anything about it. We don't even allow this. We cannot tolerate this. Now, what would happen? What should have happened is he should have called the police. He should have served time, and he should never be in a pulpit ever again. Well, that's judgmental. No, it's not. Higher standards for bringing the word of God. Hello, if I ever do something like that, I pray that I would never step on the stage ever again. God will forgive me. I'll serve. I'll clean. I'll do whatever. But I have no business being in the pulpit. Why do you think the church has gotten so pathetic and weak? Because we allow sin. Now, I say this about myself. If I ever do something like that, throw me out. Pray for my restoration. But I have no business having a podcast making thousands of dollars for my sin. Hello? Sin will destroy you. We cannot tolerate sin like this. But we got to do it very gently. Now, I know that's controversial for me to say that, but it's in the national news. The church ought to talk about this. We're afraid. We have to talk about this. Listen, it could happen to me. I don't have the popularity. I don't have the temptation. But listen, if that ever happened to me, I need to be thrown out of the pulpit. Boy, it's quiet in here. <laughs> it's about restoring. The goal is restoration and transparency. Let me give you another story of what happened. There was a situation a number of years ago. A pastor in this local New, New England area... Uh, when he was younger, he, he was having trouble in his marriage. He was stressed out in his church. He's a pastor. He went to a bar in a foreign town. This is before we had the internet uh, and all that. And he just had a couple too many drinks. And it was a pretty young lady or something. Started flirting with her just a little bit. And felt like he was, and she was responding. And he had a couple of drinks to loosen him up. And he realized where he was going. He came to his senses and left the bar, went home, sobered up, and told his wife, got his act together privately among other brothers. 
20 years go by, 15 years go by. He's teaching at a, a men's conference. And he tells the story of what happened to him in his moment of weakness. And the men responded wonderfully. Some jerk called the, 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 the district and told them, and they wanted to throw him out of the ministry. Now, that's, that's horrible. Why? Because now we're creating a place where you can't be human. If you're going to go to Mount Washington with your family, and I notice that your brakes on your car, you have no brakes, I'm going to tell you now, hey, bro, listen, I don't think you should go to Mount Washington with your family. You have no brakes on your car. Why not stop it there before the tragedy, before there are bodies you have to bury? So we, we have to look out for each other. And you have every right in the world to keep me accountable because I'm not God. But don't look for problems. I need to end with this because we're running out of time. The goal of, of this is to do it of restoration and transparency. We help them come uh, humbly and gently, the Bible says, right? Restore them gently. What does that look like? Because this is what can happen. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough so that you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him or he may be, be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So we want to restore the person. Are you guys tracking with me here? So, we're not supposed to judge outsiders. Dealing with clear sin. And so, how does that work? Well, it says in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, Judge not, lest you be judged. And people quote that all the time. Well, the woman caught in adultery, it says, Judge lest you be judged. And it says in Matthew 7, Jesus says, Do not judge lest you be judged. But Jesus goes on in that same passage. If you read the whole passage in Matthew 7, and then he goes this way. He said, Before you take the log out of your brother's, I'm sorry, take the, before you take the speck out of your brother's eye, take the what out of yours? The log, like that surgeon. Then he goes on, he says, what he means by judges, we're not supposed to put a black robe on with a big gavel on a big bench 20 feet high. You sinner! And we're just uh, arrogant. I see people enjoying when people fall. Listen, I have, no, I have no joy in talking about Pastor Robert Morris. It breaks my heart, and I'm telling you the truth. I take no joy in, in describing this to you. But if you take joy in the punishment, you have no business to be the person to bring the punishment. You should be broken about it. So what we're talking about, judging, the Greek word in the tense there, he's talking about someone who says, I'm better than you. I'm greater than you, but you're sinners. Don, don, don. That's what he's talking about. We should be broken about it and very humble because we could fall as well. And Jesus goes on in the same passage in Matthew 7. He goes on the 14 verses, what he says. You shall know them by their fruit. So you're going to judge. I mean, yeah, you're supposed to discern. If I'm a farmer and I have a great field and I have this poisonous plant that, is, that I find and, I, and you're the farmer, I say, hey, bro, look, this poisonous plant will knock out our crops. We're going to lose our farm. We've got to get rid of this. Well, how can you say that? Well, look at it. Look at the, look at the properties of this thing. Oh, wow. Yeah, see, this is poison. We got to remove this for the betterment of the, of the property, right? That would be, that's what you need to do. We need to root out sin or it will destroy us. I believe God wants to, our church, and not just this church, other churches have authority and grace. I think God wants to pour out of supernatural powers, of signs and wonders, healing people of cancer and sickness, marriages getting restored, uh, having tremendous effect on society. But if we're tolerating sin, why is God going to pour out his anointing on a people that would treat it like nothing? We're eating brownies. We're putting up with junk, and we wonder why we're sick. I'm just being honest with you folks. We have to change our ways. Judgment here means discernment, not condemnation. We wrap up this thing. Love must be tough because sin is destructive. Tough love is real love. It protects, corrects, and restores. If you enjoy bringing correction, keep your mouth shut. And if you see another brother, oh, those, see those churches, I knew it. That church has this. They say, be quiet, bro. You have the wrong spirit. You have the wrong spirit. It's like a surgeon coming in with, with street clothes and, and dirt in his hands and cutting someone open with a butcher's knife. That's not right. Love must be tough because sin is destructive. Tough love is real love. It protects, corrects, and what? Let's follow God's word in humility. 
creating a safe, accountable, and holy church. We pray that this is the kind of church that you struggle with something. You could say, listen, man, I'm struggling with pornography. I'm looking at it at least like once a month. My wife doesn't know it. I need help with this thing. Are we gonna be afraid? Well, if, if I tell someone, they're gonna throw me out of the church. No, we should have a place where we can be real with each other. I'm struggling with alcohol, I'm drinking too much, and I'm driving, and I shouldn't be doing it. I need help with this. Well, brother, I care about you. Let's surround our brother, pray for one another. Confess your sins to one another, pray for each other that you may be healed. Hey, listen, I don't have enough money to go to rehab. We'll raise money for you, help you get counseling you need. We care about you. This should be a safe place to reveal your sin. This should be a safe place like going to a doctor when you have a disease. We're not trying to damn people, we're trying to heal people. You see the difference? So, I'm not exempt from this, and neither are you. We all need Jesus, but we can't turn a blind eye to sin because sin will destroy the person in our church. If not by God's grace, I could not stand. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you are an amazing God, a loving God, a powerful God, a forgiving God. And Lord, we know that the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one that's righteous, no, not one. So Father, by no means, I pray no one misunderstands what I'm saying today. Lord, I tell you, without your grace, I could not stand. Neither could anyone else. Father, we do not take this message to condemn people. We say this message to help save people from destruction. Lord, I ask that you would raise the level of anointing in this place because we take sin seriously. We don't treat your blood as something that's nothing. Father, protect us from legalism and irresponsible grace. Lord, let us walk with fear and trembling, for God is among us. In Jesus' name.